Actually, I'm really excited. <laughs> if you knew how bad I felt this week, um, you would understand why. I'm so thrilled that I feel as good as I do and that I have some voice. I haven't actually spoken to human beings for probably about five days or been out of my house. And uh, the office and I had to text everything because I couldn't, couldn't talk. There was just nothing coming up and um, an attack on my chest. And gosh, the enemy makes me mad. But I just thought, he's not going to win. I'm going to be there on Sunday, and somehow I'm going to get a message out. And so I'm excited that I'm here, and that, um, and we'll see uh, what what God wants to do here this morning. But this actually was um, sometimes when Pastor Paul leaves, I think, oh my gosh, <laughs> and. Uh, it may appear that I'm a total extrovert and that I just love to get up here and preach, but sometimes it's a little unnerving. And But this particular message, God put on my heart before he ever left. And so that was, that was just the mercy of God that I wasn't having to carry the stress of all that through the whole week wondering, what on earth am I going to talk about? Because this came to me... Um, really, uh, simply from the Holy Spirit, I, I hope. And uh, at least I'm going to preach to myself today, if you don't mind, because it encourages me um, as, I, as I look at this text. And for those of you who are um, reading through the Bible with us on the the U version or the one that we passed out going through the Old Testament and New Testament, you're going to be um, right up with us because I'm going to be talking from uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers and Joshua. Um, you know, Pastor Paul has been talking about crossing over the Jordan, and we've been looking at, at some of what went on in, in Joshua's day. And so I just want to continue on a little bit with that theme, not because that's what he's been doing, although that works, but I've been reading through and spending a lot of time in those three books, in Deuteronomy and in Numbers and in the book of Joshua. I've just been kind of compelled by that because of where we're at as a church body. And so what I want to talk about today is about where we're going. I want to talk about where you're going individually and where we're going as a church family because I think we're in a really, really significant season right now. And I know for myself that I'm recognizing that this is a season where God is calling us to cross over our Jordan and to enter into those promises that we've waited and waited and waited for, but we have not been this way before. And we need to know how to get to where we need to go. What is that involved? And so I want to look at the first chapter of Deuteronomy and um, just share some thoughts with you about what God's been speaking to me. And I'll probably drink a lot while I'm doing this, but that's okay, right? So y'all just take a sip yourself. In Deuteronomy, the first chapter, I was struck by, first of all, verses 6 and 7. It says, The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and set your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the, Ara in the Arabah and the hill country and in the lowland and in the Negev and the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. And as I read that, I was struck with the fact that God was saying, you stayed here long enough. It's about time for you to, to move on. And I really feel like that's where we are as a church family, that God is saying it's time to move on. And for many of us who have waited and waited and waited for personal prophecies to come to pass, for promises that we feel like the Lord's made to us to come into fruition, we're at that place right now, I believe, where we're literally getting ready to cross over our Jordan and step into the thing that God promised us. And so, first of all, I think um, God would say to us, it's time to get going. We can't just stay where we are. But something else struck me in the next verse, in verse 8, that I think is really profound. And I've really been meditating on it and pondering, what, what is this all about? Verse 8 says, See, I have placed the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to them and their descendants after them. And what struck me was that first little word, that little tiny word with three letters in it that says, See. And I began to, to meditate on that and to say, God, what is that in there for? 
What are you talking about? And I believe that that is a key to us being able to cross the Jordan and make it into the promised land. We all know the story that there were millions of Israelites who left Egypt, but they didn't get to go in, did they? And I believe that that's unfortunately the story of so many believers in the body of Christ, that they receive promises from God, and it's God's intention to give it to them, but they never enter into it. And this is one of the reasons why, is that we need to learn how to see. We're not going to be able to enter into what God's giving us unless we know how to see. And seeing is more than just looking at something. Seeing is actually being able to envision from heaven's perspective what it is that God's promising us. Um, we are, are taught that seeing is believing, right? You've all heard that expression. And seeing really is a part of the process of believing what God has for us. We have to choose to allow our minds to grasp what the Father has called us to. We can't go forward into the promised land unless we learn to see. It's so important for us to be able to receive what he has for us. And he was not, he was not just speaking to the Israelites about going and, and standing up on top of a mountain and looking over into the ground. He wasn't talking about see the dirt that exists in Canaan. Look at the plants and the, and the trees and so forth. They were going to need to see beyond the natural, and they were going to need to grasp what lay ahead of them according to the promises of God. And so um, even while Brother Yadal was here, he was talking about stewarding the prophetic word. And I believe that this is all a part of that process of stewarding what God's given us and seeing that we actually enter into the fulfillment of it. Because how many of us want to receive prophetic words, want to receive promises that just sit on a shelf and when we die we say, oh well, none of it came to pass. I don't think there's any of us in this room that are part of that company. I think we're pressing in for more of God because we really do want to see the fulfillment of the promises that God's given us. And I believe that we have a huge mandate as a church family. We may be few in number, but I believe God's called us to something that is so great. It's beyond what any of us could do individually. It's beyond what any of us could even grasp or think at this point in time. I believe it's out there ahead of us. It's so close. It's like we just have to cross over the river, and we are going to see things that we have dreamt and prayed for all of our lives. It's coming, I believe, but we have to be able to see it. And I know that as a church family, we are at that place where it's time to get going, and that really at this point, we don't have a choice. We're moving somehow, and it just depends on where you want to go, what's going to happen to you. Because there were some who had to turn around and just head back into the wilderness and die there. And I don't want my carcass ending up in the desert. I want to go over into the promised land. So I'm meditating on this word to see. And, and I understood that God was, was um, calling them to see more than geography. He was inviting them to see destiny. And that's what we have to see. When we look at our individual lives, when we look at the promises that God's given us, when we look at what God's called us to as a church family, as a ministry, we look at these flags around this room and we say, well, isn't that a nice decoration in our church? Or is that destiny? Is that a promise of destiny? Is that a promise of millions of lives being changed for the kingdom of God? Is there a plan of God for us to make a difference in this valley where our relatives, our neighbors, the people we do business with enter into the kingdom of God and come to know they have a good father who loves them and they have a savior who died for them? Isn't that what we signed up for? Wouldn't we all love to see that? Isn't that better than just coming to church and being with our own little family and blessing each other and going home every week? I signed up for revival. I signed up to change the nations. 
I signed up to step into everything that God says that I am and that I can have. And in order to do it, I have to be able to see. And so I'm asking God, Lord, give me eyes to see what you're talking about. I don't want to just look at geography. I don't want to just look at buildings and lands. I want to look at destiny. I want to look at what you have promised. Here are some things that that are involved when we want to learn how to see. There are a lot of meanings to the word see. Did you know that? I mean, it seems like such a small little word that we would just look and that'd be good enough. It's not. Here are some meanings of the word see. It means to perceive. So that's, that's beyond looking, isn't it? Perceiving takes us another step. It means to have insight or understanding. So if you want to enter into your promises, you have to get some insight about what's on the heart of God in those promises. You have to get some understanding. It means to give attention to, interestingly enough. So it's not just about looking over and saying, okay, well, that's where we're supposed to go. You know, let's get out the paddle boats, get across the river, and land over on the other side. No, they had to see way more than just the geography. It means to find out, to make inquiry. See also means to investigate. How many of us have investigating the promises that we have from God? How many of you sat down with prophetic words and said, I'm going to investigate from heaven's perspective, what this looks like. What does God mean by all of this? Or do we just put it on a piece of paper and put it on a shelf? It means to consider, to think about, to turn one's attention to. That means in order to go into the promised land, we have to really give ourselves to these these promises. We have to pay attention to them. It also means to comprehend, to regard, to notice, to discern. We have to discern what's in the heart of the Father. We have to discern from heaven's perspective what the promise is all about. And I have to say, I think I've been guilty of just kind of looking at things on a natural level. I tend to be kind of practical, and so I I try and do practical things, you know, write the word down, review it every now and then, pray over it, do all those good things that that we teach in the prophetic classes, and I encourage you to keep doing that. But I felt like God was saying, there's so much more than that. We need to see what is in heaven in regards to the promised land. Here's an interesting scripture from Isaiah 6, verse 9 and 10. Most of you are familiar with that passage in Isaiah 6 where... um, Isaiah said, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And he describes this glorious experience of being in the temple and seeing God on his throne lifted up. And then we know the angel took the coal and touched his lips with it. But then when he, when he responded and said, Lord, I'm, I'm here, send me, this is what God said to him. Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now, that's another whole story. Why did God say that? But but it reveals the fact that God knows that if we begin to really understand what he's about, that there's power in that. That if our ears start to really listen, if our eyes really start to comprehend, to understand from heavenly places what is in the heart of God, what he has in mind, that there's so much that could be done in the earth. But most of us, well, at least me, I don't know about you, we tend to operate in the natural realm most of the time because it's tangible. It's what we know. It's what we are familiar with, and it's how we have to function on this earth. But God's calling us up higher. He's saying there's more to it than just seeing things in the natural. 
You've got to press in to understand, to comprehend. You've got to pay attention to what is God saying in heavenly realms about the promises in order to enter in. Well, the next thing that happens in this verse, in verse 8, it says, See, I have placed the land before you. And what I realized in in him saying that is that um, he's saying, I have placed this land before you. That's very different from ideas that we cook up. And unfortunately, throughout church history, we've cooked up a lot of ideas, haven't we? We've had all kinds of plans and programs and campaigns and crusades and little clubs and all kinds of stuff that were our good ideas of how we were going to help God get the job done so that we could all get beamed up to heaven. Is that true? You're all looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe that was a different church. But it's true. That's what we've done throughout church history. If any of you have been part of that, I have. You know, this is a great idea. God will love this. We'll help him here. I was full of those ideas when I became a believer. Me and God, I thought we could just do it all. I had all the plans worked out. But the problem is it has to be his idea. His ideas are the ones that fulfill the promises. And so he's saying, I have placed the land before you. And so I encourage you, get a hold of the plan that is God's. Don't go after a plan that seems like a good one in your mind. Find out the land that he set before you, and you're much more assured of success. So this is not something that we choose. It's not something we decide upon. But rather, the promised land is the plan of God. That's part of seeing, is to understand it's his plan. The next thing he says in this verse is, go in. He's placed the land before us. It's his idea. But we have to go in. The only way to get there is to be active. We have to choose, and then we have to act on that choice. We have to go. And going takes a decision. Now, for some of us, that comes very easily. You're very decisive. You're very quick. You're ready to move on anything. And for others, that's a little bit more painful. We'd like a little more time to think about it, a little more time to decide if that's really what we'd like to do. We're kind of comfortable. But God's saying, you have to go in. You have to get activated. We can't stay on this side of the Jordan if we want what's in the promised land. He's not going to bring the milk and honey over to us. We've got to go in and get it. And we're not going to get it if we always do what we've always done. And how many of you know that is a classic saying in most churches? Well, that's not the way we've always done it. And what's important in most churches is the way we've always done it, right? We don't want to move around that. And even us, we think we're very cutting edge and we're very out there. But there's a lot of places where we've settled. Some of you are sitting in the same pew you sit in every week. And you've sat in every year after year after year. And that's okay. But if we're going to go to the other side of the Jordan, we might have to change our pew. We might have to get up and get going. We might have to embrace change. Larry's going in, I tell you what. (laughs) Anybody else want to get up and move around? Go right ahead. I'll turn my back and take a drink, and I'll never know. So God's saying, I've given you the land. You go in. He's not going to drag you. He's not going to give you an airplane, fly you in. You've got to get up and get going. Next, he says in this verse, and possess the land. You know, we can read over this stuff and not really grasp what it is he's saying here. But to possess means to take control of, to dominate, to take ownership of. It's not enough to just move out. Some of you say, okay, I can see what God wants to do. He says to go and off we go. But the reality is, it's not just about us going in. It's about the original mandate that God gave to Adam and Eve in the first place. 
Take dominion. Be fruitful. He gave the garden to Adam and Eve to cultivate, to tend, to oversee. In other words, it implies a co-ownership with God where he's giving us management of that promise that he's given us. And so it's not enough for us to just go over and kick back and we're drinking the milk and saying, honey, bring me some honey. Some of you thought that was funny. It just popped out. It's not in my notes. But anyway, um, it really implies uh, responsibility. We're going over there because God has something for us to do there. Does he want us to enjoy it? Absolutely. There was fruit the the size that was so big that, that one cluster of grapes had to be carried on a pole with two men carrying it. That's big fruit. Okay, so there's good stuff in there for us, but it's a partnership with God where he's saying, I've got a plan for what I want you to do when you get there. So he wants his people to take dominion. He wants us to take care of whatever it is he's giving us as a promise. We got to be responsible for the care and the management of that place that he's taking us into. The next thing that he says in this verse is, the land that I swore to give to your fathers and their descendants. You see, as I said before, this is God's plan. This is not a new idea. Where we're going right now feels like a new idea to us. It's news to me. I don't think I was quite planning on what God has in store for us. But it's not a new idea. God's known about it all along. And God's letting them know as they cross over the Jordan that they are giving themselves to something that is much bigger than themselves and that this is not just any land. And what I realize is that what we're about to enter into is something that has been in the works for a long, long time. And we are going to get to step in and fulfill what others have sacrificed for, have prayed for, have given their lives for, have believed God for, and yet never saw. And when I think of all those wonderful, lovely, godly people who have prayed and given of themselves, have given financially, have given of their time, in order to see the fulfillment of the things that are on God's heart in this place, in this hour, in these nations, it humbles me and it causes me to say, I dare not throw away this opportunity or take it lightly or assume that it's all about me because it's not. This is something that God has already given an oath that he would do. But as we know from the Israelites, You can be of the company who doesn't go in, who dies out in the desert, or you can be part of the company that actually gets to live in the promised land. Anybody here want to live there? I really do. Not sure I want to pay the price, but I've got to. So God is not a man that he should lie. Scripture tells us that. We know that he's good. We know that when he swears a thing, it's going to happen. And then we know that God himself is the ultimate promise keeper. So if he's promised something, he's going to keep his end of the bargain. It's really up to us to see what happens to those promises that we have from God. So then skipping down to verse uh, 21, it says again, see The Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of of your fathers, has spoken to you. And then he says this, do not fear or be dismayed. So first of all, God reassures them that he's the one who promised the land to them, that he's sworn to give it to them, and that he would be with them. Therefore, there's no need for anxiety, for worry, for fear. But what about dismay? What is that all about? Well, I had to do some investigating. And really, when you're dismayed, it's, it has the, the essence of being suddenly disillusioned. 
You're going after the promises of God, and something happens that causes you to stop. And suddenly, you are totally disillusioned. You don't care about the promise anymore. You don't have the heart to receive it anymore. You're overwhelmed with what's happened. It's that feeling of being so disheartened or having your courage broken down. And I think probably all of us in this room have experienced circumstances where we're going after the promises of God, we're believing God, we have powerful prayer meetings, and we're thinking any minute it's going to break through, and then something happens that causes us to feel dismayed. Something causes us to think, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. I don't even know if I care anymore because my heart's so broken or I'm so, I'm so overwhelmed with the circumstances surrounding this. But we have to know that God has promised that God is going to be with us. And so that's why he's saying to them, do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Don't let it happen to you. And the very fact that he has to say that to them tells me that there's opportunity for that to happen. He's not saying to them, you just go on over and I'll just take care of all the stuff that's there. I'll just wipe it all away. You won't even have to lift a finger. No, they had to face battles. So he's telling them, don't be dismayed when you go over. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, just this chapter that we're looking at right now, people are told not to fear, not to be dismayed. In Joshua chapter 1, three times God speaks to Joshua to have, to have no fear, to be strong and courageous. He's told again in another verse not to be dismayed or even to tremble. And then it says, because the Lord is with you wherever you go. That's why we don't have to be dismayed. Could we be dismayed? Absolutely. Are there giants in the land? Yes, there are. Sorry to tell you that. I wish it weren't true, <laughs> but they're, they're there. But God's saying, it's okay. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. Well, you move along into verse 26 and 20, all the way through 29, and we find that even with the, all this encouragement, the people still decided, okay, God, we know you said you're going to be with us. We know you said that you promised this, but we'd like to send in some spies just in case. And what happened? They discover, oh my goodness, there really are giants there. Let's read these verses. Even after God tells them all these good things, it says in verse 26, yet you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you grumbled in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. You know, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why didn't he just let, leave you in Egypt and let them kill you? Why would he bother to go through all this stuff and have to bring manna and find water for you, listen to you grumble for 40 years just to have somebody else kill you? He could have killed you right then and there. What are these people thinking? But we think it too, don't we? Yeah, we do. It says in verse 28, where can we go up? Our brethren have made our hearts melt, saying, the people are bigger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of Anakim here. Well, God's really discouraged with that. You see, their lack of faith causes God to say, you rebelled against me. Did you ever think of that as lack of faith, being rebelling against God? God says he sees it as rejection of him. Because what it says is, God, I don't really trust you. I trust what I see with my natural eyes more than I trust what you've promised, more than I trust what you have sworn to give me. I don't want to be in that place. I don't want to be in the place of thinking that because God has promised me something that I'm not going to face some giants. So he says, do not be overwhelmed. Do not be dismayed. 
Because the reality is there are giants. They didn't make that up. There are fortified cities. How on earth are we going to take their cities from them when they're totally fortified? How on earth are we going to do this? And isn't that how we look at a lot of our circumstances? But the bank says, but the IRS says, but the doctor says, and we have all these fortified cities that we run up against as we pursue the promises of God. And what do we believe? We believe in the fortified cities. We believe in the giants. And God says, you know what? I take that as personal rejection of me. After all I've done for you, you don't understand that you can trust me. God's saying, do not be shocked nor fear them in verse 29. We shouldn't be shocked when we come against giants that are living in the territory God has us. Do you know right now as we speak, if God's given you a promised land, there are giants living in your land. God says it's yours, but there's somebody else living in your promise right now. And what are you going to do about it? You're going to just let them have it? I mean, there's times when I would. <laughs> I like to just pull the covers over my head and say, okay, you can have it. It's too hard. I don't want to do this. But then there's something in my spirit that rises up and says, no, wait a minute. That belongs to me, and I'm not letting the devil, and I'm not letting the giants take it from me. Because if I'm willing to lay down and say, oh, it's okay, somebody else can have what God's promised to me, what I'm saying is, God, I don't trust you. God, you're not worthy of whatever you had in your heart from heaven's perspective to release according to that promise. And so what compels me is not that I get what I want, but what compels me is that he is worthy of the glory that comes from us entering into our promised land. So in verse 30, he reminds them, he says, the Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Hello? Do we have memory loss? I think we do. I've told fire school students that when I first became a believer and started reading the Old Testament, I was so shocked by the Israelites. My goodness, chapter after chapter, God would do this amazing miracle and save them. He brought them out with the greatest deliverance of any nation upon the earth in the history of the world. I mean, for goodness sakes, have you ever seen the Red Sea? Coming up like walls on either side of them. And it just so happened of the timing was that they got through about, goodness gracious, those walls of water happened to come down just at the precise time when the Egyptian army was there. Isn't that fascinating? And then the next chapter, they're grumbling and complaining again. And on and on it goes. And, I, and I, I tell my fire school students, I used to think, you know, those Israelites are idiots. Why don't they remember from time to time God does these things for them? He works these miracles for them. And then they come upon the next problem, and they forget all about it. I mean, for goodness sakes, they were slaves of the Egyptians, and not only did the Egyptians just say, okay, you can go, go free. All two million of you, no problem, just go ahead. But they gave them all their gold, all their silver, all their clothes, all their wealth to take along with them. Hello, what's the matter with these Israelites? Don't they remember what God's done for them? Until I'd walked with God a little longer, and then I realized, oh, I is one. Now I get it. Because I came upon a problem, and I'm, oh, God, I don't know what's going to happen. And he said, <clears throat> remember the Israelites? Have I ever done anything for you? Have I ever delivered you out of a difficult situation? Have I ever blessed you? Have I ever helped you? Have I ever given you hope? Have I ever given you reason to believe me? Yes, Lord. I guess I am one. 
We do have memory loss. We forget the good things that God does for us. And so that's why it's so important for us to be in the Word, for us to be reminding ourselves of the faithfulness of God, of the goodness of God. Because he goes on record over and over and over and over with his people that he's there, that he loves them. But then they turn away from him, so he says, okay, I guess you're going to have to have another little problem. Let's try this again. And then we think, oh, he isn't faithful because we face a problem. No, it's because he is faithful. And he's trying to demonstrate to us that he's a good God, that we can trust him. And I love the turn that this whole chapter takes in verse 31. After he reminds them of what he did for them, he says, I will fight for you just like I did in Egypt before your eyes. You all saw it. It wasn't hidden. And then in verse 31, it says, And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you just as a man carries his son in all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. Oh, my goodness. Not only is he an almighty God, a valiant warrior who's willing to fight for them, but he says, you don't understand. I'm like a good, loving father. I'm the one who's carried you. I carried you like my own son, like a father would carry his child. And he's letting him know, you only got this far because of me, because of my goodness. And so often we think that we are where we are in our life because we just work so hard or we've had so much faith or whatever it is. But God's saying, no, you got here because of me. You wouldn't even be where you are right now if it weren't for me. And I think that's so sobering for all of us to just take that in right now. It's true of every one of us in this room. Even if your life feels like it's falling apart right now, you've only made it this far because God's carried you. He's carried you like a father carries a son. And he says, not only that, I've carried you all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. I think it's going to be fascinating when we get to heaven and we get to find out how many times God saved us that we never knew anything about. How many accidents did we not get into because his hand was there? How many trials did he save us from? How many times did he heal our bodies? How many times did he dissolve something that was growing in there? We never even knew about it. How many things has God done to get us this far that we don't even recognize? He's defeated our enemies in the past, and he's promised to go with us into the future. Why would it be any different in the future? Why would it be any different today, right now, whatever problems you have, whatever bills you have, whatever doctor's diagnosis you've heard, whatever, Why would it be any different now than than it always has been? God's been faithful, and he wants to continue to be. And here's what he says. To me, this is the punch. But for all this, verse 32, you did not trust the Lord your God. I think that's one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible. After all this, you did not trust the Lord your God. And, you know, on all the years that I've spoken on faith, I just love the whole issue of faith, I've come to realize that more people don't enter in, into faith because they've been wounded in areas of trust in their lives with people that were important to them, parents, teachers, leaders, sometimes church leaders, Their trust has been so broken down that it's inconceivable to them to know how to trust God, especially if they haven't had a father that they could trust. Where do they put God? How do they relate to his love? And so God's saying, you didn't trust me. And that's just incredibly sad. 
And what he wants to do and what he is doing in this hour is he's giving us a revelation that he's not just God, but he's our father. We're his sons. We're his daughters. And he's not a father like any of the fathers that we have had. No matter how awful, no matter how good they may have been, he's so much better than that. And he's proven himself over and over and over, and yet we don't trust him. He says to them, not only have I carried you all the way which you have walked, but I go before you on your way, in verse 33. This is the God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you. That's really good news for me right now, as we're in this process where we've sold the building to know that God has gone ahead of us. We're, we're not, he's not just kind of trooping along with us, you know, just da 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 da, da. Oh, I don't know, this place looks pretty good. You want to stop here? All right, let's stop here. Let's build a fire here. Let's camp here for the night. No, he goes ahead of us. Any place you've ever been, unless you have just gone out on your own, and don't we do that, we go find our own camping spot because we think we know better than him. But if we walk with him and we arrive at the place that he has for us, we can know that he didn't just think of it. It wasn't like, well, I guess this works. No, he's gone ahead of us to prepare the place where we're going to camp. And he doesn't leave us on our own. Sometimes we miss it because, like I said, we go off on our own path. You know, everybody's going one direction and we're not paying attention and we turn the other way and We find a spot that looks good to us, but we don't know what's there. And sometimes we find out the hard way that it wasn't such a good spot to camp out. And he says, not only does he go before you to seek out a place for you, he shows us the way with a cloud by day and a fire by night. 24-7, he's faithful. I mean, that's the goodness of God. They never had to just wander without a navigation system. They never had to wonder, does anybody know where we're going? Because there was always the pillar of cloud in the daytime. There was always that pillar of fire so they could see it at night. So even at night when it was dark, when it could have been very scary, when they could have lost all their bearings, God's saying, still here. I'm still leading you. And that's what he wants to do for us. But when God heard their complaining, it says that's when he made the decision about who was going in and who was not. Complaining and being fearful can eliminate eliminate us from taking our promises. So my question this morning is, do we want to go in? I have to be honest There are times when I really want to go. I want the next adventure. I want to do things with God. I'm all fired up, full of faith. And there are other times when I just want to curl up with what's comfortable and just kind of stay. And if I use the analogy of our move as a church family, I look around this place and I, there's a part of me that doesn't want to leave. We've had some amazing times in this room. Right in this very spot, many of us have had our lives changed. We've had the love of the Father come. We've had weddings and funerals and conferences and all kinds of moves of the Spirit in this place. And there's a part of me that would like to just cling to that and just say, I'm kind of comfy here. I kind of like my chair. I like these flags. I like what God's done here. I like our worship team being up there where I know what it looks like. But we can't stay. God's saying, it's time to go. And we have to do it as a family. Because what happens a lot of times in these kind of circumstances, there there are people who just don't want to go. It's just too much for them. They can't handle it. There are people that get nervous. Like, are we still going to be the same church? And I think maybe God does this deliberately so that we find out This building is not the church. I know many of us have run into people over the years that said, oh, I went to your church 20 years ago. And I think, well, you may have been in a building, but you didn't go to our church. 
because this is a different family. And so I don't want to see anybody fall back. I don't want to see anybody turn back. I don't want to see anybody miss out because it's going to get good. If God is true to his word, and if what we're seeing is clear, what we're about to head into is going to be unlike anything we have experienced so far. It's going to be amazing. God's calling us to some new things, and it's going to take all hands on deck. It's going to take all of us together, partnering as a family, to say, God, here we are, just this little band of people, but we're believing you for great things for your glory. So I just want to conclude with a few thoughts that I came up with in studying this passage. Here are some tips if you would like to be prevented from receiving your inheritance. Would you like those notes? Okay, I'll give them to you anyway. Number one is grumble and complain. God sees this as rebellion, and as I said, he sees it as rejection of him. So it was when they all grumbled and complained, that's when he made the list. Here's who's going in, here's who's staying out. And a church that is full of people who are grumbling and complaining and saying, I don't know why they're doing it that way. Well, why do we have to go over there? Well, who made these decisions? Well, do you know how stupid they are? Well, they're not even listening to God. And on and on and on, people are just start chattering away, chattering away, chattering away. I don't like this, and I don't like that. I don't know who was listening to God. And I encourage you, go back and read about Aaron and Miriam. They were grumbling and complaining. Aaron was Moses' older brother. He was the firstborn. And they go to Moses and they say, listen, buddy, you're not the only one who hears from God. Sounds reasonable to me. But unfortunately, God showed up. It didn't turn out so well for them. I don't know about you, but I don't want leprosy. So let's be careful about the grumbling and complaining. Number two, make sure that you're in control so you don't have to be afraid. Be a control freak. Make sure you know exactly what's happening and what God wants to do so that you don't get hurt. However, you may forfeit your inheritance. Do not pay attention, if any at all, to what the promised land is really like. It says in Numbers 14 that those who rebelled, interestingly enough, would not see the promised land. Same word. They were not going to see what God had because they weren't desiring to understand, to discern what was in the heart of the Father in the promised land. Another way that you can keep from having your inheritance is be content where you are. Settle for what you already have. I don't know about you, but sometimes that's tempting to just kind of snuggle down and say, I'm too tired, this is good enough, let's just stop here. And number five is allow yourself to be overwhelmed when you face difficulties. Because how many of you know there were difficulties in the wilderness too? The promised land isn't the only place where there are challenges. I heard some people say, it's really hard to be a Christian. And I think, goodness gracious, what would it be like if we didn't have God? It would be even worse. Okay, but you don't want to know all that. You want to know what do we need to do if we are going to inherit the promised land, right? How many of you are signing up for that? You want, to, you want the promised land. You want the full meal deal, everything God has, everything. Okay, I see two hands there in the back. Okay, how much faith is there in the room? How many of you really, really want everything that God has? And you want it for his glory? That's what I thought. Okay, well, since you really do, I'll give you some answers. This is all review. First, we have to see. We have to envision from heaven's perspective. We can't just look in the natural. We have to find out what's on the heart of God. Next is we need to recognize that God is the one who's already sworn to give it to us. We've got him on this. We can go to him and say, but daddy, you promised. Okay? And then next we have to trust him enough to push aside any of our fears. There will be fears, but we have to trust him enough to push them aside. Number four, we cannot allow ourselves to get overwhelmed or shocked by the giants. 
And so often we do, when we come upon difficulties, we're shocked. Like, how did this happen? We've got to know, okay, the giants are going to be there, but who else is going to be there? God's going with us. We need to recognize that we have a good father who is leading us and who has gone before us. He's already been there in the spirit. There's no time in heaven. He's already been there. And he knows all about the promised land. He knows all about what he has in store for you. And then we need to develop that excellent spirit, like the Bible tells us that Joshua and Caleb had. They were the only two of the original company. Two million, two guys. Those are pretty bad odds, don't you think? Two million, two guys. The only two out of all those people who believe God enough. And the Bible says it's because they had a different spirit. They had an excellent spirit. They were able to see. They could see. Did they see the things in the natural? Yep. They knew there were giants. They knew where there were fortified cities. But in Numbers 13.30, when the spies came by, Caleb told the people, let's do it because we will surely overcome it. That's the attitude that we've got to have to inherit our promises. When things look really overwhelming, it looks like there's no way we can win. The odds are stacked against us. We can't possibly do this. We have to be people who say, that's all right. We can overcome it. Come on, let's go. Anybody ready to go? Yeah, let's say we can do this. And God says he's allowing Caleb to go in. He calls him my servant who has a different spirit. That's what we need to develop right now. We have to say, God, we want to be people who have a different spirit. We don't want to be just run-of-the-mill Christians who want to shuffle in and shuffle out, go to church on Sunday, have somebody pep us up, give us a nice little talk, sing a few nice little songs, put a dollar in the plate and go home. But we want to be overcomers. We want to be world changers. I want to bring somebody else to heaven, don't you? So the key is that we have to learn how to see what God really has for us. Part of that is we just want, have to want it a lot. we got to really want it. And we got to ask God, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Give us understanding about what you want to do in the promised land. And let's go get it. Let's go get it. Why don't we stand? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Okay, we're going to step out on a limb. Maxine wants to share something. I don't know what she's going to say, but I believe her. I, I did not know what Margie was going to bring today. Is that correct? <laughs> I had no idea. I was so blown away. Um, I'm going to share with you what God was showing me in worship this morning. Um, when she started out um, in verses... Starting in verse 6, the Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains, in the lowlands, and on and on. Okay, this is the picture God showed me. I saw this picture of a ship, and it was on wheels on a track. And I saw the mountains ahead of us. And I saw all around was this barren desert with nothing but sand. And, and the ship was moving forward, and we were in the middle of this barren desert. And there were two kind of people in this ship. There were the people in the front, and they were looking straight ahead. And they were so excited. They were cheering and shouting, so excited. And then there were some of the people behind them, and some were looking to the left, some were looking to the right, and they were seeing what was in the natural. And God said, don't sh jump ship now. And then I kept watching this picture, and God said, this is what God is saying. This ship, the river, is on track.
And then he said, he, he said it, but I knew he was saying it to each and every one of us. He said, and if your eyes had been open to see, you would have seen there was water all around. Thank you, Lord. I guess it's time to open our eyes. So, Father, we thank you that you're good, that you have a plan for us, Lord. We thank you that, that you're even speaking independently by your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, I pray for everyone here as well as those who are in Thailand and those who are not with us this morning but that are a part of this church family. Lord, I pray that you would give us those eyes, that we would see what you're up to, Lord, if we'd see from heaven's perspective. God, I pray that, that you would help all of us to make it across the Jordan, that we would enter into those promises that you have for us, God, and that not one would be left behind. God, I pray for those who are thinking of jumping ship, Lord, that you'd help them to have eyes to see and that they would know that as we corporately enter into what you have for us, then we will individually see the things that you've promised us. Lord, that we would have eyes to understand that we, none of us, will get our promised land unless we all go up together. Lord, give us eyes to know, as the Israelites did, that they were one company. They were one people of God. Lord, help us Americans with our independent spirit to understand that, that when we go off on our own, Lord, that our skeleton is found in the desert places and that we don't enter in, even though we think we are. Lord, we ask that you help us. We ask that this week, Lord, that you would just begin to give us revelation, God, because that's what we're asking for, that our eyes might see that revelation would come of what we need to do to follow after you and to enter into the amazing future that you have for us, for which we give you thanks right now, Lord, and we, we praise you for it, God. We give you glory, Lord, and I pray for every person here who is facing a giant, who feels like there are fortified cities ahead of them where the walls cannot come down. Lord, we look to the promise of Jericho, and we thank you that you have spoken to this body that there will be a Jericho in our future, and that's a place of victory. It's a place of your hand removing those things that stand against us. And so, Lord, I pray for them that they would not be dismayed, that they would not allow fear to enter in, but that your perfect love would cast out all the fear that would come. And we give you praise and glory, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen.